Hi everyone, this is Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein, and together with ChessLecture.com, I'd like to welcome you to a series of lectures where I will go over my best games from a very strong tournament that I just won, the Spice Cup Invitational. This is a very strong tournament organized by Susan Polgar and Texas Tech University which took place in Lubbock, Texas and it's a category 12 tournament where the average rating is about 25-27 and I managed to play quite well and even win the tournament with six and a half out of nine and today I would like to go over my first round win against a very strong international master from Mexico Leon Hoyos and I am white so let's begin so I play e4 c5 knight f3 d6 d4 c takes d knight takes d4 knight f6 knight c3 a6 so as you see my young opponent is playing an ambitious opening he is going for the night dwarf and if you don't ho if you don't really know about my opponent Leon Hoyos was actually Ivan Chuk's second during last year's Linares tournament so Leon Hoyos has been actually studying with Ivan Chuk for a while and you know he's pretty booked up in his openings so I wanted to take him immediately in an unfamiliar position right out of the opening and I play a rare move a4 so this is the a4 variation of the Nidorf and let's talk about this move and try to understand why it's idea so the first thing that comes into your mind is after black plays a6 right he is about to play b5 sometime in the future so the immediate response to a6 is a4 which I played which is with one and only idea to limit black's counterplay on the queen side at the same time b7 a6 pawns could be easily fixed with a5 and actually there is a big gaping hole on b6 so you see a4 has a multi-purpose is a multi-purpose move the main idea is to stop b5 queenside expansion and later on to play a5 and fix black's queenside on the other hand a4 is a bit slow and it does allow black to switch up the opening instead of a knight dwarf he now can play the dragon and completely avoid all long castle attacks that white can do such as the Yugoslav variation of the dragon so that's what my opponent does g6 now if black chooses any other move then we actually simply play for example if e5 white can play knight f3 followed by bishop c4 or if black plays e6 white has several ways to continue including bishop e2 bishop e3 or even g3 in all give white a comfortable game so but my opponent plays g6 and I did anticipate this in my preparation and now I simply play bishop e2 bishop g7 castles knight c6 bishop e3 castles so we have reached the typical dragon setup except the pawns on a4 and a6 in my opinion this should benefit white because of the b6 hole 
but really not by a lot. Maybe a small edge, no more than that. So there is no reason to play knight b3, and I simply play queen d2. Just st strengthening up my position in the center. And now black has to make a choice. Should he play knight takes d4, or go after the e3 bishop with knight g4? My opponent decides to simplify with knight takes knight, but let's quickly take a look at knight g4. In this case, white should give up his light square bishop. And after bishop takes, perhaps knight d5. And now you could see that it's really hard for black to get rid of the powerful knight on d5. Because e6, you know, the knight can simply go back. And now the bishop on g4 is completely misplaced. So I like white's possession in this case. White has a small but lasting advantage. So my opponent plays this theoretical move, knight takes knight, knight bishop takes, and bishop e6. This all has been played before. And now it's time to fix up the queen side pawns. I play a, a4, a5 creating a hole on b6 for my pieces. Rook c8, rook takes over the half-open file. And now the unusual looking move, but quite powerful, bishop to d3. This is actually a move that has been played by a very strong grandmaster, Mickey Adams, against Boris Gelfand. And the main idea of this move is to protect the e4 pawn, so that the knight on c3 has a free hand to go to a4 and b6. So it's quite an interesting setup where the main idea is to give the knight on c3 an extra hand in defending the e4 pawn. So my opponent plays rook c6, which is actually a novelty. In the Adams ga Gelfand game, black played bishop d3, and after rook fd1, strengthening the center, queen c7, I believe, was played h3, rook fe8. Adams got a quite a comfortable game after bishop takes, queen takes, rook a4, kicking the queen. And after queen c6, a nice and quiet move, rook b4 with the main idea that you put the rook on a half-open b-file and now knight takes pawn is no longer good because knight takes, queen takes, bishop takes, bishop, the rook on b4 is defended by the queen. And so really Gelfand got himself into a bind and really hard to defend and Adams won the game in a nice style. So let's go back and take a look at what my opponent played. Rook c6. In a way, this move does make sense. Why would you want to exchange a bishop on d3, which just looks like a pawn? It really has no good moves. And in the meantime, he is ready, getting ready to triple up on the c file with queen c7 and rook c8. So I have a few ideas, but I think it's just okay for White to simply build up his position with rook fd1, strengthening up his control over the d-file. And now my opponent plays queen c7. I play a very useful move h3. Again, notice that once the black's queen side is fixed, it's very hard for black to get any counterplay in the dragon, because really the queen side is where black has to play in these types of position. And now rook fc8, and I simply make a very good move, useful move, rook a4. The rook is playing quite a few roles. It's playing an active role on the fourth rank, as well as, you know, possibly preventing bishop c4, in the future controlling the c4 square. 
in reality, white doesn't have that many threats. You know, white has a containment type of strategy here. Basically, my plan is to limit the counterplay of black's pieces as much as possible. And that's the goal of this line. It's not a very popular line, but you know, if you're not looking for complications, if you're looking for a solid strategic plan, this is the line I like. So there is no reason to force things if you're black, and my opponent correctly simply retreats the queen to d8. So we have reached this critical position. And now I play the move which I don't really like after I played it during the game, I didn't really like it because it gives black a chance to simplify into much easier to defend position. I play queen e3. I think stronger move perhaps is rook b4 and the exchange for the a of the the a for the b pawn I think favors white. Queen takes, rook takes and now the e7 pawn is hanging, and most importantly, after knight d7, white has a nice jump knight d5, hitting the queen and the pawn on e7, and if queen takes d2, and moving between knight takes pawn with check, king of eight, and then bishop takes bishop with check, and now white is almost winning. So, followed by rook takes queen next move. So very nice little tactic that I had. So queen takes a5 is no good. And now rook b8 is possible, but probably the best move now is simply rook a1, defending the a5 pawn, and keeping the pressure on black's position. I can now play bishop a7 sometime in the future, and I just simply like white's pressure on the queen side against black. So let's take a look what happened in the game. I play queen e3 and knight d7 is a very strong move allowing a very simple exchange of dark square bishops. Bishop takes, king takes. And now all of a sudden the pawn on a5 is going to get weak because the queen just left the d2 square. And knight c5 was coming up, or rook c5 was coming up. So let's try to figure out how white should proceed in this position. Again, it's hard to recommend the best move for white because position is quite static. You know, white doesn't have that much of an attack going. Y just has to maintain his positional pluses. And now the bishop on d3 looks a little awkward, and I decided to play bishop f1, which again might not be the best move. Perhaps I could just continue with double up on the a file and simply exchange the bishop for the knight after knight goes to c5. You know, I can play either rook b4 or rook a3, and if knight takes, simply pawn takes. And again, white continues to have a solid position, most importantly, applying pressure on the queen side. But I decided to kind of save my bishop for a while and play bishop f1. And now I think black takes over the initiative with correct move that he played rook c5. I really have nothing better than first I gave a check, and then I simply doubled up. And now knight comes to e5 with the tempo. Because knight c6 is going to attack the a5 pawn. So you see how black correctly demonstrated where his pieces should go in this position. So I think black has a more of initiative now. Although white's position remains very, very solid. And now I play queen d2 with a simple idea if knight c6 to move my knight such as knight d5 protecting the a5 pawn. And now black has a couple of very interesting choices. One of the choices is bishop takes h3. 
Of course, I'm not going to lose my queen to the fork after g takes h knight f3 check. And there is actually this nice little forced line, bf4, bishop d7, exclaim, hitting the rook. Pawn takes knight, bishop takes rook, rook takes rook, rook takes e5. So black has two pawns, but white has two pieces for the rook. And it's really hard to evaluate this position because after knight d5, you know, I still have all the squares, such as the b6 square and the d5 square for my knight. But two pawns is a lot, and I think after rook c5, keeping an eye on the, b, on the a5 pawn, black gets a small edge, but the position is still quite complicated. So I think this is the best what my opponent should have played. Instead, he decided to play a slow move. So rook a8, rook a1, knight e5, queen d2. And in this position, he decided to play it a bit slow, and he plays bishop c4. With the simple idea that if bishop takes, to change light square bishop, knight takes, queen moves anywhere, and knight takes b2, wins a pawn, and rook takes c3. So now, this is his plan. But again, I simply play bishop d3 back, keeping my position quite solid and good. So what to do for black? Well, he decides to play queen d7. It's really unclear what the idea of this move is. Perhaps he just wanted to get his queen out on a better square. But now I have a good move f4 forcing the exchange of knight for the bishop. Knight takes, pawn takes, and he simply retreats bishop d5. And I play rook d4. So this position is quite hard to evaluate, probably it's about even, but you have to keep an eye that all of a sudden, if white plays f5, queen h6, knight d5, he can get a powerful attack against the king, because there is no longer the light, the dark square defender on g7. And immediately my opponent blunders with e6. He simply blunders an exchange. So let's see if you can find how Wyatt wins an exchange in this position. And the correct move is e5. He plays d5, trying to defend the pawn, and knight e4, hitting the rook, he can't take the knight due to the pin, and the fork, knight f6. So he has nothing better to do but to lose an exchange. So after e5, d5, white is now much better if not winning. So he plays rook c2, knight check, King g7, and now first I have to take the rook, because if I take the queen, he can take on d2 himself, so I have to take the rook, rook takes, knight takes d7, bishop d7. Okay, so white has just won an exchange, and you might say, well, white is completely winning, and it's just a simple, simply a matter of technique. But it, as it turns out, it's not so easy to win because it's hard for white to connect his rooks and to exchange black's powerful active rook. So I play rook b4, hitting the b7 pawn, bishop b5, rook a3, defending my pawn, and now my opponent finds a very good move, d4. Temporary pawn sacrifice for the opening of the dark sorry, of the light diagonal a8, h1 for his bishop. So I really have nothing better than to take bishop c6, hitting the g2 pawn, g4, and rook takes b2. Again, white's rook are, are, rooks are very passive. One has to defend the a5 pawn, the other one the f4 pawn, and white's king is kind of passive too. And really, 
it's hard for me to defend my king side pawns. So I think black does have some compensation for the exchange, and it really makes my job quite hard to win this endgame. But I think this is a very instructive way how to win endgames in these types of positions. So let's take a look. G5. Since I'm going to lose my H3 pawn, I want to create E5, F4, G5 pawn structure to completely lock down the four pawns on the king side. So rook G2 check, king F1, rook G3. So you see he is going... Well, actually, I think I played the first move I played, rook d8, trying to activate my rook. And now we have this rook g2, king f1, rook g3, g5, rook takes h3 position. Okay, now I play king e2. And my main idea is to activate my king. Because the only way I can win this game is if I activate my king and break through, not on the king side, but on the queen side. Okay, this is very important. And we're going to see shortly how. So after king e2, rook check king e3, rook check king e2. So my king is running away on the queen side. Rook h4, rook d4 back. So white has a very simple plan. King c3, king b4, king c5, king b6, king a7. Once the king gets to a7, one rook is going to be cutting off his king, the other one is going to come over and win the b7 pawn with rook b4 and rook takes b7, and try to convert it into one rook endgame. So this is a very important lesson. You have to think, not in variations, but in terms of plans. Five moves from now, where do you see white pieces? Where do you see black pieces? And think like that, because black has a weakness on b7, and the only way white can win this endgame, if white penetrates with the king, attacks the pawn with the rook, exchanges the rook for the pawn and bishop, and goes after the weak a6 pawn, and converts into one rook and pawn endgame. So let's see how I could achieve that. So after rook d4, it's black to move, and he plays rook h2 check, king c3, and now rook f2. So basically, he kind of locks down both of my rooks. I cannot play rook b3 due to rook a2. I cannot move my d, pawn, my d rook too much because I have to watch out for the f4 pawn. So really, not much I could do. So first I decide to activate my rook a little bit. So at least it can move somewhere on the first rank. And he simply moves his king closer to the center. I actually think that h6 was a better idea to try to exchange as many pawns as possible, but then again it leaves a lot of files open for the rooks, and white still has a good chance to win. Well, now I simply execute my plan, king b4. Remember, I simply want to play king c5, king b6, king a7, rook b4, and go after the b7 pawn. I'll see how black can stop me. So he plays bishop d5. And I continue with my plan. King c5. And he plays rook b2. Alright, so you could see that black is doing something to prevent my king from going too far. Yet, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid because I can simply offer a trade of rooks. And he can't really take it because it's much easier to win once one pair of rooks is traded. 
So that's why he goes rook c2 check. I continue running to the corner with king b6, rook c3, and again, no rush, simply defend my pawn. If rook b3 check, well, king a7, and the king belongs on the a7. So he plays king g7, trying to activate his king. Okay, so now it's time for my other rook to play a role. I play rook a4. Rook c6 check. This is kind of a desperation attempt. Now let's try to figure out if white, sorry, if black simply doesn't play rook c6 and tries to kind of keep an eye on the b on the B file with rook B3 check. Okay, if rook B3 check, I could simply play king A7, and if rook B5, I can play rook B4. If he tries to avoid the exchange, this is a perfect idea. Rook takes check, bishop takes, king takes, A6 is going to fall, and so well the game. Black is completely busted. So this is my principled idea. And if he plays rook c3, I can kind of continue the same plan. I can even give up the d3 pawn. Takes, takes, takes. And again, a6 pawn falls, and so does black's position. There should be easily winning end game for white. So rook c6 is kind of a desperation attempt, and I didn't even calculate king takes b7 because I simply play king a7. I think king b7 wins as well, but I already saw my my main plan. I play king a7 and. Really hard to preve prevent my, my next move, which is rook b4, going after the pawns. So he plays king rook c7, and I simply play rook b4. So this position is already very critical, probably maybe lost. If rook c5, I can sacrifice my exchange. Takes, rook takes, rook check. Then I take the a6 pawn, and it's a quite easy win. If he takes with the pawn, same thing. Rook takes, followed by taking on a6. And again, should be an easy technical win. And he simply plays bishop f3. Alright, so stopping rook takes d5 plan. Because if he doesn't play that, rook takes d5 and rook takes b7 is a big threat right away. Well, now that all of my pieces are standing very nicely, his rook on c7 is actually misplaced, I simply decide to play rook c4 and offer the trade. Once he trades off rooks, the game is lost. So he has to play bishop c6, and now the nice finesse, king b8. So you see how white king came all the way from g1 to b8 for the win. Now he has to play rook d7, there is no defense. Rook takes, king takes, and now the final touch, rook b4, he can't prevent me from rook takes b7, simplifying to one pawn endgame. So he plays for a couple more moves, bishop d5, just to see that I actually take that pawn, bishop take, king takes, and this is quite an easy win. And there are actually several ways I could win that, but my favorite is this line, takes, 
So you stalemate black. All right, now black is completely stalemated. He's gonna play either f6 or h6. I take g5, h7, and now black gets mated just like that. A very nice technically won game. This gave me a comfortable lead in the tournament and I will actually continue looking at my next round, round two game in the second lecture which I won with black against a very strong Irina Crush. So thank you very much and I hope to see you all next time. Bye bye.